situation we're talking about. Does the uh, Carlyle Corporation, the Carlyle Group, does that name pop up at all in any of your work and research? Yeah, the Carlyle Group always uh, pops up, uh, you know, because they've got the, the highest levels uh, uh, political connections worldwide, everybody from, you know, former President Bush, Bush one, to uh, former British Prime Ministers, John Major, that kind of thing. And so they're very wi- they're wired into the highest levels of uh, uh, corporate government and intelligence circles. They're powerful. Um, their tentacles are said to be everywhere. But uh, pinning these guys down in a lot of cases is difficult. It's a, it's a private company, isn't it? Yes, it is. They own more than 600 corporate and real estate uh, groups. That's pretty big. Wow. That, that, that is big, and that translates into uh, uh, political influence. So um, Carlisle Group, while not the subject of uh, our investigation, I think is uh, worthy of continued uh, uh, surveillance. Uh, absolutely. And, and again, you know, the money trail, you follow the money. In this particular case, we talk about the $57 billion. Does it get bigger? How much more money is involved? Well, we don't really know, um, George. But certainly, if we're talking that it's $57 million in the U.S., uh, $57 billion, billion in U.S. government uh, contract alone, there's a lot of money out there, and this is global. This is happening uh, all over the world. It's being privatized. Um, this vaccines um, a big, big business for, for, the, for these corporations to research all this. So, um, and again, this is part of the problem. It's so much of this is shrouded in secrecy. We don't know what's going on um, in, in these labs. We don't know a lot about um, you know the, the, the black budgets, for instance. Um, so we need more transparency. We need to for people also to educate themselves and uh, and also try to find out what's going on in their communities, in these labs, in university labs, because you know there could be a university right near you um, that's conducting um, research, classified research on anthrax, uh, and uh, that could pose a threat um, to the, your communities. Because one of the things about this, George, is that you know unlike nuclear weapons and you know we we, we interviewed a, a great um, expert on this uh, professor Jonathan King from MIT and and he made this uh, really good point he said even an oil spill will degrade over time even nuclear leak and nuclear radiation actually will you know over many many decades will dissipate but germs once they're out there they reproduce yes you can't pull them back they run rampant all over the place and they've been leaks uh, they've been escapes of, of these uh, agents I mean we traveled um, to Russia to a place called used to be called Sverdlovsk on the edge of Siberia it was um, one of the centers of the secret um, Soviet program and they had a secret military lab there where they were weaponizing anthrax and uh, had a big operation there and one night the night shift came in they forgot to change a filter and a little bit of anthrax some people say it was just one gram floated up out into the vents and went across the sleeping city and they had a huge outbreak of anthrax and over um, 60 people at least 66 people died Um, and we went there and we found some of the victims spoke to them, um, and the Soviet authorities covered it up for years. Uh, basically, said that, that yeah. happened. It was bad meat, um, but that could happen anywhere. That could happen here in the United States: an accident, a crazy scientist, um, or you know, even darker scenarios. Well, maybe we've got to test this stuff, and the government tests it itself on on its unsuspecting how public. Do, how do people die with anthrax? <laughs> Basically, the, what happens is the anthrax is naturally occurring. It, it occurs in, um, in Africa and Asia, here in the United States. It, 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 it lives in the soil. It's a spore, isn't it's it? It's a spore, exactly. It's a bacteria. And it, and it, it, it mostly infects uh, hooved animals, cattle. Horses. Goats, exactly, horses. And usually um, you can, humans can contract anthrax either in two ways, actually eating contaminated meat or... Um, coming into contact with um, hide 
meat and you've got a cut and it gets into your bloodstream. That's called cutaneous anthrax. But the anthrax that he's used um, in bio war is a very different kind of anthrax. It's inhalational anthrax. And what they do is they take these spores, they have to refine them, they have to mill them, and make them small enough that they can actually breathe into your lungs and get past all your membranes and everything into the deepest recesses uh, of, the, of the lungs. And it gets into your bloodstream. And then the bacteria attacks, uh, attacks the body, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very painful uh, death, and, and uh, you get ulcers and swelling and internal bleeding and all sorts of horrible things, and uh, very painful, horrible death in a few days. In your opinion, both of you, what do you believe is the big picture here? Well, the big picture is uh, that I think we're in a dangerous situation where... Uh, there appears to be a, a germs war uh, arms race uh, underway uh, globally uh, that uh, uh, the corporate sector is uh, profiting uh, from and the uh, general populace knows nothing about and for which there is no political uh, will to um, even look at this by the media and then to organize uh, around it. Uh, people don't even know about this. We interviewed for our book, a wonderful fellow named Ed Hammond. He uh, ran an organization called the Sunshine Project, which was the only uh, project. And I, I say everyone go to their website because they have the best data on uh, everything uh, germ war related. Uh, Ed was a crazy man. He uh, filed 31,000 uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. And so what he was able to get from the government is pretty great. But he basically was a one-man band, and he couldn't raise money even from, you know, uh, reputable foundations or peace foundations. They said, yeah, with nuclear stuff, we can rally and get deterrence and maybe a lessening of arsenals. But this bio stuff, the uh, interests are too big. So Ed Hammond had to close up the only NGO looking at germ war, and uh, his wife is Colombian, and he lives in Bogota now, and I think he's teaching English as a second language. Jeez, it's just an amazing story. How long did it take you two to put this together? Well, we've been, uh, you know, basically uh, Bob started looking and thinking about this years ago. And um, so it, it took years. But once we got together and uh, uh, got the funding to actually run around the world uh, to do the research from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and French and German television interests, uh, it took us about five years. That's a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. Like Woodward and Bernstein, I don't think they were too concerned about their own safety. What about you two? Uh, there are hairy times. I mean, the, 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 the hairiest time was, uh, you know, we went to the uh, Soviet Union. We went to uh, the place where uh, the anthrax supposedly uh, leaked from, which uh, is something called Compound uh, 19. And uh, Compound 19 um, uh was admitted as the source of the leak of anthrax by Boris Yeltsin during a brief moment of perestroika. Um, the new uh, Putin regime came in and said, no military activity there, no leak. Terrorists did it. Okay, that's the official line. Well, so we went to film uh, the perimeter of Compound 19 for our film. We had to get the shot. And that was kind of a, a, a nerve-wracking moment because there we were on tourist visas, filming uh, perhaps a secret germ war labs. And uh, uh, that was a nervous moment. There's a great scene in the book. I won't give it away. you got to go buy the book. Yeah, you guys got to be careful. Up next, phone calls with our two guests on Coast to Coast AM.